Welcome to episode 79 of The Nero Show. In today's episode... Testosterone replacement therapy for the everyday cyclist. Shortcut to FTP gains or just good for your health? $7.5 million wasn't enough to save the NCL. What's really going on? The road bikes we've seen people riding that they really shouldn't be owning. And why does it seem kit brands are marketing to non-cyclists? All right, let's get into it. I reckon we're on this week, Jesse. We're on? I reckon we're on. <laughs> It's one of these weeks where I don't think there's a, like there's, there's not a bucket of show notes and just like general current events, mm-hmm. but I'm 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 keen for this. Yeah, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of chat. Yeah, where are we starting? Are we going to start off with? Uh, I'm going to start off with your mate, cycling barber. Cycling barber. <laughs> do you want to do you want to fill the fill the audience in in the what? the journey that is? You just sent you sent this to me out, out of the blue. What do you reckon? So maybe we should play it through. Yeah. Because he, he cuts to the chase. He does. He, he doesn't mess around here. Day 31 of trying to raise my FTP to 5 watts per kilogram. So I finally got all of my blood work back from the labs. Everything is perfectly healthy, except my testosterone levels are incredibly low. So to be completely transparent, I'll be starting TRT in the next couple of weeks and documenting everything along the way. So this 5 watt per kilogram is slightly going to be boosted. Let's see if they'll throw some EPO in there too. Just kidding. All zone two for today's ride, and I also got an ice bath from Sauna Box, so I'll be doing some of those in the morning to wake my lazy ass up and begin riding nice and early. So let the boys what, dope, boy. What's let happened? the boys dope. Jesus, Coil, you're on him already. All right, let's go. Well, the comments were the comments kicked off. Okay, as in a classic Instagram reel form, there's a lot of stuff going on in these comments. So situation here, I, I'd say, especially in the masters category, in in Road cycling, fairly getting more common, fairly common. Guy goes to either a doctor or a, maybe an anti aging doctor, gets a blood test. Testosterone's low. Oh, you'd probably benefit from some testosterone replacement therapy. Do you take it or you do not take it? I want to push back straight away on this because this, just to lump, lump masters cyclists in with this guy is unfair on master cyclists. Okay. I don't regard this guy as a cyclist. Right. And maybe this is a chat with- well, his name's the cycling barber. Whatever. But he is, he's an Atia. He's a Huberman. This is a life biohacker who has crept into our scene. Good luck to him. That's all fantastic. But I'm, this guy has, it, it comes down to like, he's, his goal in cycling is not a racing goal. It's a, it's a I'm going to raise my FTP. It's a, it's a generic life goal rather than cycling goal. So that's where I'm coming at with this and whether he should or shouldn't be doing this, I don't particularly give a shit, but I would push back initially just on categorizing this guy as a master's cyclist. I'll agree with you there actually. So is this doping? Now this because the top hearted comment on this reel was this is just doping. Blah, blah, blah. I know plenty of endurance athletes who ended up with low testosterone and didn't just start taking tests. They had to rest, blah, blah, blah. So he's basically accusing him of doping. Now, his opinion is he's not doping because he's not breaking any rules because he's not racing. And I'd have to agree there. Uh, if, 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 he's, if he doesn't have a, you know, he's in the US. So if he doesn't have a USAC racing license and if he's not entering Grand Fondos that have an anti-doping clause... All he's doing is racing on ZWIF, training, maybe a group ride. Then he's not really doping because doping implies a breaking of a rule. So I don't really agree with the people piling on here being like, oh, you're just, you're doping. I don't, I don't necessarily agree there. But there's, a, there's an absolute murder of, 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 of any logic in, in the comments here. So there's one question here, one comment here here says, this is, testosterone reference range is 300 to 1,000. So if you're below a thousand, you're not doping because this person has friends who are naturally at 700 to 800. Uh, that is, uh, what old, are you talking about? Old, get me up to 50 hemocrit. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's okay. literally the same logic as me being like, well, I'm taking EPO, but I'm only going to take it to get my hemoglobin to 170. And I know a mate who naturally has 170 hemoglobin, so I'm not doping. That is... But let's look at let's look at that comment and who and and the wording of it, right? I know plenty of endurance athletes, right? So to me already, 
I've been, I'm flagging that person as probably a gym person because they regard anyone who's doing exercise over the, an hour as an endurance athlete. They probably don't know it as a cyclist. So in their world, yeah, that's, that's the way they think. It's like, well, you're, you've got a little bit more natural talent, whatever, in that regard. They're not thinking in the, the cycling space. They don't have the, <laughs> the, the checkered history we all know of this sport. And so that commenter, and this is the problem a lot of the time when you're talking about these sort of stuff, especially on Instagram Reels, like this has clearly gone way out of the cycling audience and it's gone into the gym junkie audience. And that's the way these people think. Yeah, but just on the levels, right? So it's mm-hmm. 300 to 1,000. And he said, well, my levels are currently 232. So it's not really cheating if I just take a bit of testosterone. It, you, I think it's a bit of a stretch to think that that attitude isn't actually in road cycling. I mean, that's what we think based on the people we hang out with. But, I mean, if, the, if that's the attitude of the people in these comments, I mean, sh- who's to say that's not kicking around the yeah, master's scene. I mean, it, it, sure it would. Oh, I'm just on a, you know, doctors have said I'm a bit low. So, so you know, I, I'm, only on, I'm only taking 100 milligrams a week, 150. You know, it's not, it's not doping because well, I'm just getting into the healthy rate. Yeah. Which is just, I mean, it is doping because it's against the rules. But just in, 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 even in an ethical sense, it's still doping because that's not how – <laughs> You're shortcutting your way there. Now, what to, that, I mean, that's a point going to what you said there. Like what Wild West medical system is it in the US where – now that's what he hasn't said. He said my doc – I did a blood test with my doctor. He said my testosterone was low. If by doctor he means maybe he went to like a testosterone clinic and it was an anti-aging doctor, in which case I w- it would make sense. Um. I know from speaking to some people here in Australia, it works differently. Generally, a, a GP, which is your general, your family doctor, your physician, at least in Australia, doesn't appear to be as liberal with their prescribing of, of TRT. Maybe it's different over in the US, and he has just seen his, his local doctor, done one blood test with the testosterone. Oh, it's low. Here you go. Here's a script. Okay, that'll solve your testosterone problem, but... What's caused this, this guy's testosterone to be low? And that's the question I have for this kind of TRT crowd is like something's caused your testosterone to be low. Like has it been low through your adolescence into being an adult and you have some genetic issue with your pituitary gland that you have always had low testosterone? Um, or have you just not been treating yourself that well your testosterone is low, in which case, yeah, taking testosterone will help fix that gap. But there's, there's that whole other spectrum of things, well, specifically related to this, this cycling barber's performance that testosterone will mask, but it's not going to fix. You know, if he's sleeping Great five point. hours a night, what good's, yeah, you fix, it's, just, it's just a Band-Aid. No, that's a good point. That's a, that's a good point. Just in regards to the, in the competitive road cycling scene around the rules around it, just because your doctor prescribes it doesn't mean you can take it. So. At least in this, in this, well, actually, no, I think it's wider actually. For you to get a TUE for testosterone, you have to have a proven genetic disorder that causes low testosterone. You can't just have functionally low testosterone because you overtrained for a month and then you got a blood test. And then your doctor said, well, you have a medical issue, so here's a TUE. You can legally take testosterone. So even within what the rules are under WADA, they are, they are, the, the process for getting a TUE for testosterone replacement therapy is quite strict. It's a series of blood tests. Last time I checked, it was over a series of months and also with a test for uh, what the actually underlying cause of your low mm-hmm. testosterone is. It can't just be, oh, I drink too much. My testosterone's <laughs> low, so I'm allowed to just take testosterone. So just keeping that in mind as well, even trying to go down the get a TUE for it, it's not just, well, my doctor said I can take it, so I'm allowed. Yeah, I, I don't, and I, look, I, I was obviously – I'm trying to push back on you to create a conversation here, um, but ultimately, I don't know, a lot of this to me – cycle. <sighs> how do I say this? Right. We, we, we kind of think of cycling as this really inclusive sport that everyone can get into. Mm. That's true. 
But not everyone can ride at five watts per kilo. There's a reason that's quite a high athletic achievement. And for someone who, in, in this particular circumstance, he's got a he's got a physical job. I, I think he's. I don't think he's that old. But anyway, he doesn't look. He looks. Doesn't he look, looks probably that's, twenty. That's seven. actually why this triggered me in the first place because I saw this and I was like, this guy looks like he's seventeen and he's on TRT. But anyway, put that aside. Um. So he's got this physical job, blah, blah, blah. He probably has a lot of responsibilities outside cycling. And these things probably do in many ways affect his testosterone, which would therefore affect his ability to get a high FTP. Therefore, it's probably not a goal you can achieve. Like just that's it. Face the reality. <laughs> Unfortunately, cycling is, is a sport like that. It's fucking brutal. It's hard. There are people who are far more talented than you are who will have higher FTPs. I know this is like just going around in circles kind of chap, but I just hate this easy, easy out attitude, which I do think, and I've said this a little bit before, I do think does come a lot from the biohacking crowd. Yeah. That's, yeah. we're going to start cold plunging. We're going to start staring at the sun in the morning and all of a sudden I'm going to wake up in a two months time and it will be like, oh, suddenly my life is perfect. The sad reality of cycling is it's so frigging consistency based. It's just hours and years of just grinding to get anywhere that the biohacking crowd, that doesn't compute with them. <laughs> so this is like, oh, my testosterone's low. Well, I know how to fix that. I'll get some... More testosterone. And why five watts per kilo? Yeah. That's really fit. I mean, yeah. what? <laughs> why not just say four? And if your testosterone's low, tr like <laughs> try and be healthier to restore it naturally. I just, it's, it's, it's such a weird yeah, mentality. I mean, I think the age thing makes a difference for me. If, he, if this was a video and he was 60. Agreed. And you're going, well, you've got a natural decline in testosterone by that age and you're still really burning the candle at both ends with your goals and you're not competing in anything competitive that has an anti-doping clause, eh, go for gold. But as a seemingly 20, let's say 25-year-old, it, it's so irresponsible of the doctor to just write the script. I mean, I just, it's, it's really, I mean, it's, I, I was, when I saw this, I was kind of shocked because I'm thinking, well, how many actual cyclists that would just be doing this? Mm. Even and just being like, well, my doctor said I need it, or I'd be better taking it, so I'm just going to take it. But then they'll just, but but still go and race or, yeah, well, like obviously, it, obviously the go putting it, go going racing thing, but okay, may, maybe to like is what it, is, does it? I mean. The, the side effects of taking TRT are, from what I gather, relatively minimal. At the dose, he's, yeah, at, at a TRT yeah. dose, yeah. yeah. So, Except he kills your sperm count, so I hope he doesn't count. want to have kids anytime soon. So is he, are we just carrying on because we're racers and this is a big no-no for us, but for, for someone just looking for, I, I don't know, I, I find it hard to, Defend, but you know what I mean. Like, mm. is it just to let the boys play? You know, just no no side effects. You know, maybe maybe he doesn't drink. Maybe he's living this sort of you know pure lifestyle. And Look, maybe he is. Maybe there's no health stone left unturned, and he's sleeping nine hours a night, and everything's dialed in. And for just some reason, his testosterone's low. I just think that that he that would be few and far between of the people that are taking TRT. That, I, I, I know because I've spoken to people. It's just, oh, my testosterone's low and I do 20 other things not adequately. But it'd be nice. I'll just take the testosterone. Like, why would I want to go and fix all that stuff? Anyway, um, carrying on in this sort of health scene, let's, let's keep it moving. Is this an interesting sort of com comparison here? GCN did a really good video with, with Dan Lloyd and it's blown up. It's blown As, up. So it went up yep. three days ago. It's already on 300,000 views. By the time this goes up, it, it'll be above 300,000. It's Dan's journey back to health and fitness. A um, couple of reasons why I liked it. Firstly, it didn't pander. It was just him standing there without a top on in the thumbnail 
And it's just a journey back to fitness. So in, in the video, he does go through and explain uh, what happened, where he's at now, the fact that he was smoking for quite a long time, drinking too much. Um, he was also, Dan was quite high up in GCN. So he was going through the launch of GCN Plus and the GCN app, the then the purchase of that, the then making that, the, the, the disbanding of that. So he's work-wise, I can only assume, has been going through a lot of a lot of shit. So he's had that sort of stress, and now he's gotten to the point where he, he wants to get things back on track. And I just think, first off, this was just a really, uh, what will be a quite inspiring video in terms of um, the health scene. What did they do really? Because I totally agree with you. But I've seen a few of these from, from sort of cycling YouTube people, not even just cycling YouTube people, but I watched them and I immediately was like, oh, you're just, you're just, you're trying to get the soft audience to buy into your sad sob story, which we've, you know, we've seen, I think we've called it out a few mm -hmm. times in the past mm -hmm. when, when we've seen it, like, oh, I've stopped drinking now, feel sorry for me, this kind of thing. Mm. But what did they do right here? Because this did, it hit, the, it hit all the marks. It didn't seem to sort of preach anything. Um, it, it gave a really good um, insight, I think, into maybe, maybe it's just the character of Dan is, is a kind of engaging, interesting character. I'm not sure. But what, what for you maybe? Well, I just thought it was genuine. Know, okay. It wasn't, oh, I drank too much and I really struggle with alcohol. Everyone feels sorry for me and I'm on this journey, I, which I just – yeah, both like of us you switch chose off to drink. immediately. Like you, yeah. So it, this was just, this is where I'm at. He spent maybe a minute talking about the things he'd done wrong. It wasn't some sub story. And then it was just, well, run the battery of tests he did and then setting himself up for, for us sort of following along. It, it was just tastefully done, I'm not trying to you know, pull on people's heartstrings, and, which I just, it's just, you, you know, you're making YouTube videos and they don't make us feel bad because you drink too much. Yes. So I, I appreciated that. Um, just in light of the TRT thing, here's where I find it interesting. Okay. Okay, where's this should, link? Well, should Dan Lloyd – is it, would it be fair game for, for Dan Lloyd to take TRT? Uh, okay. Okay, so he's put on weight. He's put on visceral fat, so he's, he hasn't been eating that well. I can only assume he's been, as I said, really stressed with, with his work. He's been smoking and drinking. If he got a – did he get a blood test here in the video? Can't remember. Uh, if he did get a blood test – and they tested his testosterone. Would it be low? I, I, I could, I'd say there's a pretty good chance he doesn't have optimal testosterone. So it also wouldn't be a stretch to think that, <laughs> at least if he was maybe in the US, some doctor says, hey, you should probably go on TRT. You'd be better for it. Um, medically, I have absolutely no opinion. <laughs> on it. Um, I mean, I don't know what the... Is there... Is there a real medical downside to really low testosterone? I'm probably sure there would be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. sure. I mean, yeah. Go for it. Go for, go for go it. Go down. Basically, yeah. Down I like, mean, <laughs> if, if, if in, in that circumstance. It just seems like a similar situation yes. to this other guy. Yeah. Except, I mean, well, the other guy's doing it for performance reasons. He's trying right. to get the five watts per kilo, whereas I think what came through with Dan, he's trying to make his life better, mm. you know? Um, so, yeah, maybe, maybe he should. Maybe, you know. Mm -hmm. I think there would be definitely people. Now, I've just totally made a whole bunch of assumptions, mm. but let's just run with them. Assuming maybe his testosterone is, testosterone is low right now, I think there'd be quite a few people in this situation that probably would take TRT. My point is I'm on board for Dan's journey to see where he can get to by just making the lifestyle changes and seeing what progress that gets him. And I think that's that's more of that's more of an inspirational, aspirational story than, or oh, here's my journey, my TRT journey, which you see you don't see it in mm. cycling. I've seen it. You know, the Mark Lewis has done it, and some of the other sort of health. You know, all the pod, every freaking podcast is on TRT. It's like that's the done thing in that scene. I think it's cool. Dan is doing just the just the real bread and water. Um. What's the big Health weight journey. loss drug? That's Azempic. Azempic. Yeah. Get him on. Get him on the. Bread. <laughs> Give him the full. <laughs> Give him the full. Well, stuff. that's what. Maybe that's what. Maybe that's what Chris Miller wants to see. He wants to see. So with this, 
an alter ego Dan's journey back to health and fitness, and it's the full yeah, the Dan Lloyd AI <laughs> yeah. bot. It's the Icarus sort of, yeah. version. Yeah, I think this is just a better way to approach it. it. No, and then it maybe uh, look, maybe Dan can't get there because he's yeah. uh, now he's in his still young. I think he's in his forties. Is he fifty something? Is he? Actually, not sure. I already is. I, I will say just as well on the actual video, they did a whole battery of testing. I will say it's a bit unnecessary. I mean, he's on like dynamometers and isometric machine, like of leg extension, like all this really expensive. Like this this machine he's on that's testing is it has a set um, load, and then it's like reps the range. But that that machine probably costs like forty grand. So a lot of this stuff you could just do. If you've got a power meter and you want to do some strength testing too, I mean, you can just, how many push-ups can you do? How many pull-ups can you do? What's your six-minute power? What's your 20-minute power? It's a bit unnecessary, all the tests he's done. I mean, a lot of people could just do this at home. Um, the body composition test, you can't really do at home. That's the only one where if you really, if you want to get your body fat percent and your bone density, you're going to have to get a DEXA. The rest you can kind of DIY. I do feel like, and I know Dan was a pro cyclist, very good professional cyclist. I feel like he was almost the last generation of pro cyclists that you saw finish up their careers and really blow out. Like because they had such a really bad relationship with food and diet and nutrition, it was that full like starve yourself mentality type thing. And a lot of the professional cyclists that have, once they retired from that realm, just went, really destructive the way they, uh, you know, approached their body. I feel, I feel like the new generation of guys now that are maybe still in the peloton sort of coming out of it now, like, you know, I, I kind of think like when Michael Matthews retires, he's not going to be a blob. Like he will just be a normal living <laughs> human, which is a good thing, clearly. <laughs> like it's that I think we've come out of that phase of the guys leaving the sport totally just, destroying themselves. Maybe I could round this into a little thought bubble I've been having. I don't know where I sit on it. All right. But our cy- modern modern cy- I don't know what yeah, modern cyclists, right. r- riders these days softer. I'm not talking about pros. Okay. Not even talking about like elite races or anything. Just the general cyclist. Club club guy. Club guy. Yeah softer than they were 10, 15 years ago. Can, can I, I think you think this, well, tell me, why do you think they're softer? I think you, you're, you're hinting at that they're, they're softer nowadays. What's, you tell me, try and convince me why. I mean, I actually think the, av- the average enthusiast road cyclist now is, is, is tougher, is putting more in. Just like this Random dude who's like, I want to have a five watt per kilo FTP. Like, what? <laughs> That's such a high level. The bar, the bar nowadays is. I agree. Is yeah. like double. Don't what don't it was. disagree with that. It used to be yeah. like if you could just make it to waterfall, if you could ride a hundred k. Yeah. You were like the good and 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 pull some turns. You were a good rider in a club. Now it's like you got to be aero tucked in and you got to be sitting on thirty five k an hour. And, and you've got, you know exactly how many watts you're doing and you know what your FTP is, watts per kilo. But does, and you uh, can't, yeah, okay, you, I think, you, I think this is what I struggle with. You're right. Like all the metrics have, have doubled, tripled what, what an average cyclist can do. Like I, I was just in the park the other day riding next to someone. They're telling me that, you know, they're just a very average, normal cyclist. He's, he's riding four or 500 Ks a week just because he knows he's, he's following his training plan, blah, blah, blah. I totally... Yeah, it's it's not. I think it's more the psychology. Like, are they willing? Are they? <laughs> I'm gonna get myself in trouble for this. But like, are they willing to hurt themselves as much as they used to? Because okay, what I feel is that we we can we want to avoid pain. We want to avoid suffering. There's ways to avoid it. It might be PRT. It might be an aero bike. It might be a better interval session. I don't know. Just the, the pure suffering. This is it's such a back in my day chat, isn't it? I know you're just laughing. <laughs> I at wholeheartedly me. just, just yeah. I, I'm not okay. even, I'm not on the same. All right. I'm thinking, okay, think barrel classic. Mm. 
it's it's way harder than it was, mm. let's say, 10 years ago. Like, the level is so high. Mm. If you're not to the point where now, even just to be mi- sort of m- mid, that sort of mid to, to, to sort of 75th percentile, you, you're, you're really good. Mm. Yeah. You're not just like yeah. Like, I, I what you, what, you, what I what I'm what I'm I've I've disconnected good from soft. So, and I regard myself as kind of maybe a bit soft in that regard as well. Like I, I would, yeah. I okay. I do think there are a large group of riders who are soft because they 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 don't even step a foot in that circle. Mm. They look at it and they just go, no, nah, I'm just going to buy a Paz Normal kit. I'm not even, and I just don't, I'm, I think that, that they're being soft because they're the, oh, what could we call them? The hobbyists that never step beyond being a hobbyist. The fashion cycles. Because they, the fashion cycles. They, they never step beyond that because they see the level of that crowd and it's so high mm. <laughs> that I think, if I was going to call anyone soft, it would be the, the fashionista crowd that don't get into the fitness cycling because the level is so high. I could see a point there, but for the people that are actually do make that step, none, uh, it's, it's, no, they're so, they're actually they're way harder than they were before because yeah. there's no punting it. There's no fluking it. It's, it that, that, no, that's a real fair, that's a, that's a very fair comment. But actually. that group of fashionistas, wh- wh- who were they, let's say, 15 years yeah. ago? Like who, who, they might know. not have even been in the sport. And it's interesting. So I, you know how I kind of threatened to do this rant about like fashion cyclists are all pandering, softing around the place. And, and I had a few people reach out about it and kind of just informing me in a polite <laughs> way, uh-huh. which was quite nice, I thought. But saying that a lot of the people in that crowd have not come, they've, had, they've got no history of competitive sport. No com- history at all of competitive sport. So most of us all grew up with playing some kind of sport, like cricket, rugby, rowing, soccer, tennis, whatever it was. Like mm. Saturday sport was what you did. You, you competed. A lot of that crowd never, ever had that. They were probably doing piano lessons or something on the day, and now they're in the sport. So for them, the jump to actually race, it's just it's not only – a physical step, but it's, it's just not something that's ever been something a part of their lives and existence at all. So I, yeah, I've kind of backed off that okay. rant for, <laughs> for the moment because I'd never thought of it like that. Right. Cause like c- cycling is a sport to me. It's not a hobby. It's mm. a sport mm-hmm. and a sport is competition. Like I can't, I can't play around a tennis with you without it ending in, we're going to, we're playing a, competitive match. I'm just going to hit the ball to you. Like we will, we will start keeping score. Mm-hmm. That's how I play sport. Yeah. That's not how someone like that thinks about cycling. Mm. Yeah, that's all. And, the le- and if they did start to think about it a bit more and they go, everyone's got a four watt per kilo threshold. What's like, I'm, I'm at two. Mm. What, how, that's such a big leap now that you, I can kind of see why you, you might not even bother because you just go, well, that's, <laughs> it's such a big gap. All right, fair enough. Cycle sounds soft. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll accept that yes. for now. A quick break to discuss sports micronutrition brand Pillar Performance. Traditional nutrition products like hydration and carbohydrates will take you through to the finish line, whereas Pillar's mission is to get you to the start line in the best condition, over and over. In this episode, Pillar wants to bring awareness to the benefits that magnesium supplementation can have for you as a cyclist, particularly as it relates to your sleep and recovery. Do you have trouble getting to sleep each night, or do you suffer from reduced sleep quality, particularly after your biggest training days? If so, magnesium supplementation can help improve all areas of your sleep, by regulating melatonin production and reducing cramps that interrupt your sleep quality. Pillar's Triple Magnesium is a 300 milligram blend of absorbable forms of magnesium that tastes great and is in form sport batch tested to be free from banned ingredients. If you would like to try Pillar today, get 15% off by using code Nero at pillarperformance.shop or for North American viewers, head to thefeed.com slash Pillar and enter code Nero for 15% off. Uh, other big news this week was, can we actually, can we talk about this, Jesse, or do you want, have you got any other? Big news? Random stuff. You no, I've got talk nothing. About? Yeah, what, what do we got? Yeah, I want to talk about the NCL. 
Oh, yes. The National Criterium League and its uh, demise. Done. So, um, yeah, I'll just quickly, for those of you who haven't seen this, the National Criterium League was a domestic professional criterium competition that was um, started last year. Uh, it's had a big amount of capital investment from lots of very famous people, um, $7.5 million of capital investment. Uh, and this week it announced that it has, well, I think the official term was paused operations right. effective immediately as it looks to restructure and rebuild for the 2025 it, So season. this is what, I, just because I'm in Australia, I, I, I haven't made a heap of attention to it. I didn't realise... The NCL isn't just a league no. that hosts r- races. So over the time they've been running since 2023, they've, they've hosted three. One, One two, three. two, three races. Three. That's it. Three criteriums. Not s- tours, three crits. But that's not the only thing they did because the, the teams that were a, a part of the NCL also ran. So part of running the league was also running three teams. Underneath that. So it wasn't just that they've done three races. They also had up until, well, basically now that the teams are defunct because the league's been paused, um, they had also been supporting paying rider salaries, getting equipment and running the teams who also went and didn't just do the three crits that the NCL run. They also raced just generally as part of the crit scene across the US too. So I didn't I never really consider that they were also managing teams. But I mean, that's. The money, can we talk about the money here? So they they had seven and a half million of capital investment when it when it started. And they've ba- they've run for not even two years, because it was twenty twenty three and then what? How many months are we into twenty twenty four? So not even two years around and they've seven and a half million US dollars is is is, is is wiped off. Well, has it has it well, all disappeared, where Jesse, is it? or has something else gone on? And, and look, uh, unlike you, I have paid. I don't know whether I paid a lot of attention to this, or I just have been forced to pay a lot of attention to it because I got sent a lot of stuff about this in the last 24, 48 hours from different people. And something here stinks. There's a little. There's a little stench going on, and I don't know exactly what it is. Uh, I'm actually hopeful we'll have someone on in the next couple of weeks we can talk specifically about all this. But, look, there's, there's things like, um, like pre-season team camps where we're staying in five-star hotels. We're, we're talking about – I've heard rumours that it as part of – because to get this at a capital investment, right, you put together a proposal. And yep. so part of the proposals that I've heard is that there was an intention or a proposal to have in year three almost $85 million of earnings coming through this league. And obviously the only way something like that would happen is if there was like some big broadcasting deal or something like that would come into the equation to to boost this, well, boost the coffers here. Okay. Now you could maybe argue that the demise of GCM Plus here because the only experience I ever had of watching any of this was on that GCM Plus. I think it was like the Miami or maybe it was the Denver one, which just suddenly appeared mm-hmm. on GCM Plus. But I don't think there was, you know, a, a, an $80 million broadcast deal in the works just before GCM Plus disappeared. Um, then there's this whole other thing about these NDAs that all the, all the writers and the management were forced to sign. And this is super weird. When's the last time you, were, you signed an NDA? About the about an NDA, so you can't talk you can't about, discuss about the ins and outs of your correct. your what anything what anything related to, with this to the team. Yeah. No, yeah. Okay. So and then there's this look. Obviously, lots lots of people are super pissed off. But one of the um, team managers, Michael Creed, went to Instagram and just absolutely tore one off the uh, NCL VP of Teams, Reed McAlvin, who's a big name in the US seen he was clearly involved pretty heavily in putting this whole thing together. Um, and there's a tone in, in his post here that kind of says that he's, he's not afraid, so this Michael Creed guy isn't afraid of the repercussions of not being able to 
continue in the sport by calling a spade a spade here. I'm just confused why he's so up in arms because Avolo is just a, I think they're a Conti team or they race internationally. Well, I, I, I'm struggling to see why he is all pissed off with NCL because he doesn't run an NCL team. What What's, yeah. Well, why is that annoying? I, don't, I don't know the specifics of that, but, but I'm trying to read between the lines of this that it, it seems like things, well, it's pretty obvious, things have been promised by the NCL that then the teams were were then were then leveraging off their sponsors or whoever their riders their staff and now that's all fallen through and then once once that sort of crumbles down you're as a team left and I don't know what kind of things were promised we're we talking races are we talking financial investment that would be my guess that that in, in some way that the NCL is financially involved in some of these teams that would be the way I'm sort of looking at it. Um, and that's probably why NDAs are involved. Um, but ag- again, like, yeah, I mean, this just, it's, yeah, it's pretty, I don't really want to go down that route, but there's, there's obviously a bit of crossover with what we were sort of talking about the other week here with something domestically trying to turn into a commercial, turning that into a commercial viable product is just a, very big challenge with big, big risks and downsides. Um, but my, my, I, I suppose my worry, not so much, oh, so worry with, because the easy thing, and I, you've seen it in some of the comments underneath it, it's like, oh, road racing's dead, gravel, blah, blah, blah. Right. And it's just, it's almost like the first comment under anything when it comes to this sort of stuff. And I just, yes, there's, there's obviously that element to it, but the fact is that Gravel's just doing this shit better because Gravel's actually engaging mass participation. It's engaging grassroots people. It's it's not faffing with all the fake pretend professional stuff that we've been shoved down our throats by by the boys' club. You know, it's just stripped back and it's working. And yet that framework which is pretty obviously working, doesn't seem to be something people in road want to be involved about. Now, obviously it's very hard to, you know, if you're trying to get capital investment from someone, it's pretty hard to say, well, you know what, we, we need $7.5 million to run a really super stripped back mums and dads league that's going to allow anyone to race because there's, there's less barriers to entry. It's not a very sexy product to sell, but it's certainly – a more sustainable product to sell. And I think as gravel has proven, it's the only thing that works. So is the takeaway from this NCL thing that it should just never have really happened in the first place, that it's actually done more harm than good? Is that sort of the... That's where my head's at. Okay, that's what we've got. That's Okay, right. And And we don't don't need to... We don't need to... Um, reinvent the wheel when it comes to this stuff. The weird thing, there's so much cash here, mm. but the NCL races aren't the biggest. I think what's the biggest criterion in the US that you've got Tour of America's tough. Dairylands, you've got Tulsa Tough. Um, they're the, the they're the two uh, sort of uh, not, they're not staged. They're kind of like staged criteriums. Like those are the ones that have come to mind. Like the Denver NCL. Even though it had all this money, I mean, I because it was on GCN, I don't know. Yeah, it's just there are already. But they were going to make it commercially viable, Jesse. That's the whole brilliance of it. And that's what we're going to. Yeah, anyway, been there, said that. Um, and, uh, yeah, and that's my thing. Like the Tulsa Tough, these sort of events, they're, they're huge. Like, and, and even if you, I don't know if you've watched many of Jeff's videos. I've been watching quite a bit of the NorCal footage lately. Like there's a shitload of people turning up and doing racing. Like even that Redlands um, classic had a heap of people there racing. So I don't know. I just, I just want to push back on this being the death knell of road cycling because the NCL didn't work. My two cents from afar is this shit was never going to work. Double down on the fact you've got a lot of people who want to actually race their bikes and just make it much easier for them to do it because it's proved. It's proved that people are turning up. 
and wanting to do bike races. I feel sorry for the riders that now out of contract. Well, like they're out of they're out of contract for the rest of the year. Who I mean, always loses in these situations? I mean, it's a stitch up for. Um, yeah. Hope. Yeah. I mean, hopefully they just go and race the races that were already on. You know, the Tulsa Tough and stuff on other. Can they join other teams, or can the can the teams run independent of the? Probably not. They probably got some some non. They probably got some really fucked up non compete. Whether I don't know. What we'll see. Are you coaching any any guys in the US at that sort of level? I got what? Yeah, I've got. I coach one rider as, who's on a big Criterium team in the US. He's but not part of the NCL. Yeah. Okay. And he he's on he's he's got he's on a good gig. He, he gets some like it's 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 a. I wouldn't say it's a career, but it's it's just he doesn't have to work. Um so it's pretty it's a healthy it, yeah. it's a healthy it's it's a healthy scene. I mean if if you got riders getting some sort of oh salary not really salary, some sort of money coming in every month um to keep them afloat while they can kind of race as a essentially a professional and they're not in the NCL. I mean that's that's you dream of that in mm. Australia. So that already exists aside from this NCL. So, I mean, we're kind of just – the fact that we're talking about it <laughs> is, is where maybe we're making the problem worse. But it's, it is interesting that this, this money comes in, we're things talking- pop up, and then it just disappears, and you're back to, well, the races that were already sustainable and were running. And We're talking about it because it's a very re- relevant conversation in this country at the moment. Mm. So that's, that's why commercially – yeah, anyway, said that. Um, but I'm super interested in the comments, um, down below for this one. So do let us know your experiences on this, if you have been involved in it. And like I said, uh, watch your space. We're certainly going to follow it up with, um, with some more specific stuff on the show in the coming weeks. All right. Back to basics. I want to more, I'm done with it. We're all off, you know, all theoretical and buddy. ideological and let's go back to some equipment chat. Yep. Let's, let's, go, let's just, let's stick with what we know, right? Cause we were riding around Centennial Park the other day. I thought I should. Oh, I feel bad saying this, but there, there's a guy on a bike. <laughs> we feel bad John. saying this. We're, we're basically going to talk well, about that. We've this. ridden past someone and gone, oh, that's a dog of a bike. I mean, fuck, how rude are we? Um, we didn't say it to him. No, they didn't. I mean, like, I thought literally it. rode past him and go, geez, that's a piece of shit, mate. <laughs> no, like, it's not a bad. It's not a bad bike. It's just in 2024, <laughs> there are bikes that have. Are just redundant. Yes. No, that, okay, that's now, again. This bike in particular. So this is a community service, what we're yeah, about to do. Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Community service. Right. Yeah. So what it was, it was it was a giant TCR disc, but a 2017 edition. And it really is a bike that shouldn't exist because it was one of the first generations that went disc brake. So it was basically giant TCR chassis. We've just bolted on a disc brake caliper. Slap them on there. You've got external cables. There's, base, there's almost no aerodynamic tweaking to the frame. So you've got what is essentially what was a climbing bike that's now the weight of a mid-range aero bike with external cables and it's, and it's not doing anything. Thankfully, they've tied it up the TCR to the 2024 TCR. Cables are out of the wind, so at least it looks nice. A couple of watts faster, and then they finally managed to refine the frame enough around the disc brakes that it's a competitive weight. Mm. But I, that in 2024, the old 2017, 2018 TCR discs, just buy if you wanted, you should just get the rim brake version. Because I look at that and then compared to my bike, yes. and I'm on a 2017 rim brake TCR, and I go, that smokes the disc version. Looking back now, that first iteration of disc brake bikes did such a disservice we you pro, we're still paying the consequences of how bad those bikes were now yeah and it's 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 legit because they are dogs of a bike and i'm sorry like the comments <laughs> are going to be oh i've got this bike i really like it it's crap i'm sorry it really is crap i so i've experienced two of these bikes first was the bianchi xr3 which i've spoken a little bit about that on this channel horrible it was so bad <laughs> So it was their first, it was exactly what you said, Jesse. It was, it, this was when they were still designing frames for rim brake bikes, but just slapping on through axles. And the, the word compliance was not in the vocabulary of anyone riding these bikes. It was so harsh, incredibly harsh. And again, like not aero. And you just, you would literally just, 
this this was the point. I mean, there was an XR3 disc and an XR3 rim that were out at the same time, and the XR3 rim was a beautiful, fast, like relatively affordable for a Bianchi bike, and the XR3 disc was like a kilo and a half, two kilos heavier, stiff as fuck, and it was sorry, just like hellish to ride. And because they didn't, they just basically got the frame, the tubes where the disc brakes attached, they just made them thicker. Mm. And so it wasn't just, oh, well, it's the rim version, but 300 grams heavier because of the disc brakes. They were like easily a kilo heavier back mm. in the original days because they didn't have any time to <laughs> refine them. And the reason we get so uppity about bike reviews is because I went back and read some of the bike reviews. Now, I will call myself out. I did a review of that XR3 disc and I certainly wasn't as harsh as I should have been. But I went back and I read some reviews. Now, well, you're, other, a, you're a sponsored rider. I was a sponsored you're, rider. It was a team this bike. This is true. I mean, you got to, you know. Yeah, you got to shill. You got to <laughs> shill yeah. out. You have to shill for yeah. the team. The other one, the other only one I've experienced, so that uh, was the Cervelo R5, but it was the 2019 edition. So it was two iterations ago, but it was the disc version. And you go look, I think poor old Dave's done a review of this when he was at Road CC. And they all talk about, oh, the ride, the ride quality is a little bit a little bit harsh, a little bit here and there. That does not go anywhere near as far as describing about how absolutely robust and brutal that bike was. It was just like lighting a fire up your ass, the amount of reverb and reverberation you were getting through there. Just a really, really bad, bad bike. That whole iteration, it's like, what are we, like 2017, 2018, that kind of area is just not a great place to be. Well, they kind of run on, if we say four, three year iterations. So the 20, if the 2017 was the first year, then you had a 2020, and now you've got the 2024. So you're basically on a bike that was designed, if you bought it in 2017, you know, that bike was being designed in 2015. 15, 2016, then you've got a year of production and stocking it. So, yeah. It was it's like four it was, generations ago. It was almost. just, it was slower, heavier, and less comfortable. All of them. <laughs> like, it okay. just, it was the trifecta. Um, but you've that's got, not all. Well, you've got another one here. I, I mean, we really just, we've, we've basically just said every climbing bike that then had disc brakes put basically. on it. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Because you've got here 2018. 2018 uh, Imonda, Imonda SL Disc yeah. 6. Yeah, it was I, shocker. <laughs> shocker. It was like I, an eight I, and a half kilo climbing bike. I think the stiffness on this one was the problem. Yeah, right. I coached a few riders that rode this and they, 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 they were, it was just, they did not feel that. It didn't feel snappy. It wasn't snappy. That was what I've heard of the older Imonda. I think we've just Imonda. trashed the secondhand bike market for, for anything in this particular um, vintage. But you're dead right. Like it's just so so confronting looking at it when you're like your bike that, that is like peak rim brake and at the exact same time you were trying to be flogged this thing that was just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the same year you can get the peak rim brake bike or you could get the worst possible version of a disc brake bike. And like unfortunately that person bought the disc brake one and if you're riding around Centennial Park, you don't need disc brakes. So it's, yeah, it was just change. What about the early? What do they do? What should they have done? Should they just have waited? Give it, give it another, like sort of put the disc brakes on the current chassis. Don't release it. Wait another two years. Well, and then release it when it's a respectable weight. Yeah. Is that what they should have done? Pretty much. Wait for the tubeless technology to catch up yeah. as well. He could have masked quite a few evils with 55 PSI. In when did you move to tubeless? 2020, when we went to the, bore, the bore, Campy Borers, yeah. 2020. But then yeah. we were only running 25s. Mm. That wasn't the full experience. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, so, 20, so in 2018, you, you were a real front runner if you had tubeless. You were yeah. one of those weird tubeless weird ones. <laughs> yeah. What about the, what about the early... The the re, the aero bike, that early aero bike phase. To me, this isn't something that it's a bad bike. So I'm thinking, you know, that the, the early iteration of the Propel, the even the Venge, 
to a degree. S5 stands out S5, for me. The Cavendish first version. one. Yeah, the we're talking disc brakes though. Oh, we're talking disc, well, right? I am. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and System Six. To me, all decent enough bikes. But what I've all I keep noticing this. I don't know if you're the same. Mm-hmm. But I say this: the people riding them, I don't think are the right people who should be riding them. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. But that's only now. Yes, because bef- until this latest generation, let's say you're buying a Cannondale System Six versus the Super Six. Well, if you're buying it in 2024, the difference at really high speed aerodynamically between the System Six and the Super Six is not that much. I'm pretty sure the System 6 was 203 at Tour Magazine's testing and the, and the new S- Super 6 is 207. So they kind of, from the latest generation, they sort of bridged that gap. So if you're looking at someone now riding a Cannondale System 6, unless they're some 80 kilo guy with a 400 watt threshold, you'd go, yeah, makes sense. For everyone else, when you're looking at them now in mm. the current generation, you kind of go, you look at most people. I see most people I see riding the systems. So you go, well, actually, you'd probably be better on the new Super 6. Yeah. But obviously at the time they bought the System 6, the gap hadn't closed that much. And so it was probably maybe back then if the old Super 6 was, if Tour Magazine tested, maybe if it was 215 watts aero, aero drag, then you'd, you could maybe say, convince yourself you'd want that one. But, yeah, obviously you look at that System 6 now and you go, ooh, I live in La La Land sometimes because I think when, – when was the last time they actually worked on a rim brake frame set? So the SL6, the Tarmac SL6 rim brake, if mm. we, we want to call that the, the pinnacle of mm. a rim brake bike, was released in 2017, which means they probably stopped actually working on it at least in 2016. So it's been eight years. and. Probably if that was 2017 release, it would have been a 2020 release. If we were on a, if they still had ran a rim brake tarmac, we would have two more update cycles already. And I start to go, imagine what that bike, what would that bike be now? Is that to be a good pandering because video? The, because the tarmac has gotten, with the disc brakes, has gotten a lot lighter. Like what's the, how much weight have they stripped off that, that production bike stock from the SL6 disc? The SLA, they've probably taken a kilo off it. Mm. But the problem would come with the actual brakes being that we would want, like, we would want the development, the, I'd want 25 mil rim internals with my 30 mil tires mm-hmm. on my rim brake bike. And I would wonder how would that work with the calipers? And then all of a sudden, I'm not sure how, like, the, the forces at play come into that when you're, you're trying to fit a caliper around that and get enough stopping power into, onto a carbon clincher because it would be a carbon clincher around that sort of thing and whether you'd actually start going backwards rim brake wise when it comes to the actual ride quality. I'd like to think they'd figure it out. You know, Shimano go, okay, everyone wants wider tyres. Um, my regular, so not direct mount, my regular rear brake on my TCR, I've got a 20 mil, 28 mil wide tire on the rear there that, that fits in there. So if the group set was keeping up and it's not a stretch to think that they, they would have managed to make that wider and wider over the last two generations. And so you could have, what would it be? I mean, would it be a six and a half kilo fully aero bike that's the speed of the Simplon Pride that weighs six and a half kilos that can fit 32 mil tires with a rim brake? But it'd be stiffer than the disc versions because you don't have to reinforce all the areas where the disc brakes are. It's what a shame. Mm. <laughs> the, 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 what we could have uh, be very um, no. The sad. wheels would be shit. I disagree. The wheels would be shit. You you the, the experience. No, I, I don't think so. You do have to put the brake track on. You that's have to the, get the, that's the, problem. To get the, the brake problem track is on there. The, and I yeah. just I just think that's going to overly affect the way that. The, the wheels are able to, to be – you don't you won't be able to get the shape on the wheels that you have now. Um, yeah, I, I just I – just, It does give more freedom for the no rim. There's no way is... in hell. I've got a third oh, – the 25 mil rim internal, I've got a 30 on the front now. Mm-hmm. Like I don't even want to talk about it. 
because I I'm genuinely that so so much Kool Aid now that I feel like by talking about it, it's giving people knowledge about the this sort of performance advantage that I have. I don't like that's how good I think these just massively fat things are, and I just can't see how a caliper works. But that's why I get angry because it. it, it you can't tell me it'd be impossible to do. No, of course not. Absolutely. Because it was you'd had eight, year, for eight years to figure out how to f- fit a, a, a 30 mil front tire on a 25 internal rim with a rim brake caliper and a brake track. I'm yeah. sure they could have figured it out. And that's why I get annoyed because I know they could figure it out. They just chose not to. And so you could imagine if you had that as it is, but with rim brakes and it weighed six and a half kilos. Yeah. I and mean, it, and. Uh, I, I think discs are horrendous. I think I, I do. There's a part of me that thinks disc brakes are a, it, we're in like the, the middle ground of the main solution. The main solution's coming. It might be a hub based braking system or something like that. But now that we've, we've got all these things internally based in the, in the, the frame, why do we need these big spinning rotors of death? On the outside, surely we can't. Can't we get some sort of wireless braking technology <laughs> yeah. in there? I mean, like magnet, magnet, magnet. You know my air, like the air hub. Not air my. Hub. It's, it's your air hub. Yeah. It's not my, even my. I call it my air hub. The air hub I'm borrowing off you, which slows you down via magnets, mm-hmm. basically passing by each other, and it just adds resistance. Little magnet comes in. A magnet sits in the fork, and there's a little one in the wheel, and woo, slows you down. Yep, nice and smooth. I'm on board. Yep. And one day it slips and it locks in and you go straight over the handlebars. <laughs> All right, so I want to finish up, JC, just by a little chat. Um, I got sent this by a few people, but this is just a moment where I don't have an answer. I don't have a point. This is just a question because I'm out of touch here. All right? So this is the uh, Panormal Studios escapism collection. And I got sent this picture uh, of a person in their yeah, kit. <laughs> What? What can I say? Well, I mean, They're just really pale. I mean, what's the problem? I, what, what's going on here? Their marketing campaigns seem to be images of everything except someone riding a bike. They've just picked a very weird photo for that Instagram, this Instagram story thing we're seeing here. I mean, he's, he's, he's kind of like... Looks, he looks very pale and his eyes are sunken in and he looks, he looks quite sick. And he's kind of staring off. But then in, in the actual product page, I'm on men's escapism, light bibs, and they've got other photos. He looks like a cyclic. He's, he's quite lean and he, he's got, like, you can see his quads. And he, he, looks more, he looks more normal there. But I'm just, I, 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 I'm not sure what, like, why is that the one you've picked when you've done your ad? You know, someone sit, sat there and, and set up the ad campaign. It's not so much the fact that, I don't know, like, cyclists were all weird looking people. Like, that's not sort of my point. My point is normally that the images that I seem to be getting sent these days are anything other than images of people riding the bike. Like it's far more common now for me to be sold a map jersey with the person in the map jersey at a disco or lying on a couch in a, like not in a cafe or anything, like lying in like a fashion shoot type thing. I don't, obviously that's the, that's the route this stuff's all taking. Maybe it's just a way to stand out because everyone has seen a jersey on someone on a bike. And so you're kind of flicking, you know, you're on your phone. You just, I was like, Kit, what's he doing lying on a couch or laying in a shopping trolley? I don't, maybe it's just, a ten, it's just a, trying to get your attention. I don't know. I don't know. It is, yeah. I suppose a lot of these are uh, probably from the brands that, you are trying to differentiate, you differentiate, differentiate, got there in the end, yourself from, okay, we're not a world tour brand. Okay, we're not, a, um, we're not pressing the marginal gains of an aero base layer. We're, we're trying to find another niche to, to get into. So I, I understand it from, from that perspective. Um, I just kind of find the imagery sometimes a bit strange, especially given... I know the people that they're marketing to, but you know. Anyway, neither here. Well, nor it there. works because PNS is. Uh, oh, they're killing it. <sighs> they they're are killing it everywhere. So, all right. Thank you for your time this week, JC. No problems. We will see you all again next week. See you then. <laughs>